Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here on EWTN. And once again, we have this opportunity here on the Journey Home program to share a story, to share this continuing unfolding of the gospel as it occurs in our lives. And tonight we're joined by Jeffrey Schott. He's a former Baptist and atheist. We're going to hear more about his story in just a moment here. Uh, Jeffrey, I read your story a couple years ago. You shared it with us. Thanks for joining oh, us. Thank you so much. Um, really fascinating stuff. It's, it's one I was telling you beforehand that I identify with in certain respects. I'm sure many of our audience out there do so either in their own lives or in the lives of their children. Um, because you, uh, I mean, you had a Baptist upbringing. Mm -hmm. We'll hear about that in a moment. But mostly your journey revolved around the questions of God himself, you know, and religion itself. And so many people have been in that situation or have, you know, children who are out in that situation. And so I, it's good. Really important testimony. I'm excited to hear it. So thanks. Oh, for thank you. Yeah, I'm excited service. to be here. All right. Well, where where do you where does it begin? Where does your story begin, Jeff? Yeah. So like you mentioned, I was raised Baptist. Um, my family raised me in Florida, Largo, Florida, and we attended a Baptist church that was there. And I was also homeschooled with my three brothers. So aside from going to church on Sunday, we would also go there three or four times a week to meet up with the other homeschooled kids. You know, still getting the socialization. And we were part of like a, the Awanas program where we would you know, be taught about the stories from the Bible and learning to memorize scripture passages and stuff like that. So right from the beginning, it, there was kind of this deep love of the word of God. And also you were instilled with this like zeal for evangelism. We were told, you know, to talk to people about Jesus. But at the time, everybody that I knew was a Christian because I didn't have like a public school exposure and all of my friends were other kids who were in this Baptist uh, environment. So what ended up happening was, as I got older, and I was kind of like graduating from the Awanas program, I decided that I would kind of linger behind and kind of be like a teacher's aide where I would help the younger kids learn and assist the actual instructors of the Awanas program. So that was where my journey started. And when I was six years old, I asked to be baptized and I ended up being baptized on Christmas Eve. So that was a special day. And that was kind of my whole life was focused around the church. When we weren't at church, we were hanging out with other friends from church, other Baptist kids in our homeschool program and everything. So that my whole ex exposure to life in the beginning was yeah. very much in this environment. And do you, so you asked to be baptized. Do you recall, did you have a sense of, of God's presence, like a relationship with God at that point? Or was it more just the atmosphere of, this is what we take seriously. Yeah, I remember it was actually interesting that it was kind of seen as odd because when I was six years old, that can be a little young for some <laughs> for some Baptists. So I remember I actually had to kind of like be interviewed by the pastor when I because I told my parents I wanted to be baptized and they said, well, you know, we, we might have to have some conversations about this because it wasn't necessarily the standard age. Right. So for me, it was I, I knew deep down that that was what was supposed to be done. And I think it was a good part of my journey for that to happen kind of earlier yeah. maybe than it would have even in that the tradition. Sure. Okay. Well, what happened next? So we continued going to different Protestant churches, um, mostly non-denominational, not exactly always Baptist, and but eventually we moved to Tennessee. So my with, for my dad's job, we moved to Tennessee and started going to different uh, non-denominational churches there and it was kind of the same thing where we would be going more than once a week to hang out with all the other kids and stuff and on Sunday school I kind of gravitated toward the same role where I was like helping the, the, the teachers with like the younger students and stuff like that but then my parents ended up getting divorced and when they got divorced they kind of left the whole the whole church scene ah. it was very the, with the the situation with the church and the whole divorce there was arguments over whether or not it should take place and stuff like that so we kind of just stopped going to church for a while but I still considered myself to be a very spiritual person and I still wanted to talk to people about Jesus and at this time I had I was going to public school so when I entered the last year of elementary school leading up into middle school we transferred out of the home school into the public school and in Tennessee the school that I went to was right across the street from my house so I would walk to and from school every day and I ended up walking to and from school with a couple of the other kids in my neighborhood and it just so happened that they were like the three non-believing small town Tennessee kids that were around and so we would as we would walk to and from school we would 
you know, they would question me on my beliefs. And one of the things that we really ended up talking about was not necessarily my theological beliefs, but I had been raised uh, to be a young earth creationist. Mm -hmm. So I thought the earth was 6,000 years old and they started presenting me with evidence that that wasn't the case. And so leading up to the year that I was gonna start high school, I decided that I would dedicate the summer between middle school and high school to basically proving to them that the earth was 6,000 years old and doing a bunch of research on the topic. But as I started doing the research, it pretty quickly fell apart for me. The, the whole idea that the earth was 6,000 years old. But for me, I connected that with what Christianity was. Right. I didn't understand that, you know, you could believe in Jesus and salvation and then not believe what we were taught about creation. Right. So when I, when I came to the conclusion that I couldn't believe in young earth creationism anymore, for me, that was the same thing as apostatizing mm. basically so I I still remember I was sitting in my computer one day I was like doing all this research upstairs in my room and then when the final straw kind of really broke the creation back that I had I ended up just like standing up from my desk and thinking like I'm not a Christian anymore and so for me that and that happened pretty early in that summer that I dedicated to studying the issue so after that what I ended up having to do was try to figure out what should I believe at all? Because as far as I was concerned, I wasn't even a Christian anymore. And I started looking into a lot of different types of beliefs, all the different major world religions. But at the time, one of the main um, phenomena that was taking place on in the media and on the internet was what was called the New Atheist Movement, mm -hmm. which was spearheaded by men like uh, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris. And I ended up, because I was looking up debates about between religious people and other traditions, trying to figure out, you know, who had the better arguments. And I came across all these debates from like Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens with different people. And for me, it really resonated because I felt like I had been lied to. Mm -hmm. So I, had, I was reacting against this right. idea that my fundamental beliefs about the nature of the universe were wrong, right. and so I thought maybe a lot of other people's fundamental beliefs were just a delusion. And so when I came across these people who were making seemingly very good arguments and very passionate cases for the idea that religion as a whole was just a delusion and that it was keeping us back and all that sort of stuff, it really resonated with me. And so by the end of the summer leading into high school, not only had I apostatized, I had kind of adopted the mantle of being mm -hmm. a no outspoken uh, atheist apologist. I wanted right. to kind of free the other people who were around me from this, you know, baggage that I felt like had been keeping all of us back, and including myself. Right. We're joined tonight by Jeffrey Schott, former Baptist and atheist. Um, Jeffrey, I, I wondered if you'd comment for a moment. One thing that comes to mind is it's, it does. It seems almost like you were primed to receive those arguments from that the, kind of the mm -hmm. new wave atheists, because in some sense they are mo they're in dialogue. Well, as far as we can call it dialogue, specifically with beliefs of your particular background, again, yeah. with that kind of fundamentalist Christianity, that's when they are attacking Christianity or religion, that's kind of the, the image that they have in mind a lot of the time, would you say? I would say very much so. And yeah. one thing I've kind of observed as I've grown in my own understanding of the faith is that atheists and fundamentalist Christians tend to kind of read the Bible in the same way. Yeah, so when they're arguing about these things, it, it never was presented to me that there was a different way to read the Bible that didn't necessarily lead to all these conf conflicts with, with science or, right. or whatever you know logical arguments that you would have had. So it was very much the sense that there was this kind of really limited understanding of Christianity that if you just kind of looked at it from a different perspective, it just falls apart pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah, and we'll get into those a bit more later, but it, it is interesting to know that historically, both those Christian views as well as those atheist views, they're both pretty modern, yeah. right? You know, historically, uh, they're both, they've arisen rather late in human history, uh, and they're in dialogue with each other, but there's a, there's a deeper, wider stream of thought yeah. that they are oftentimes unaware of. So Anyway, we'll get back to the narrative, though. So you, again, after this, you know, the sense of... A, not just apostasy, as you said, but almost taking on a new mm -hmm. persona, a new kind of driving force in your life. Yeah. It was because I, I basically took the momentum that I had been raised with to be evangelistic right. and then just strapped an atheist worldview to it. And yeah. so now, and now I was surrounded by people in you know, small town Tennessee, mostly 
Christian, you know, generally pretty outspoken. There was lots of Christian groups in my high school and that sort of stuff. And what ended up happening was I re received a lot of backlash. Me and the you know few other people who might have been questioning Christianity, we got we were mocked. And um, like for example, one of my brothers took a book to school that I had bought from Richard Dawkins and read, and he was borrowing it. And one of his fellow classmates like took it and threw it across the room. And then when he kind of appealed to the teacher to say, you know, is this an acceptable behavior? The teacher was just kind of like, well, you shouldn't bring those kind of books to our school. So there was, it was, it kind of, there was this defensiveness that I had kind of adopted alongside of the evangelistic uh, tendency that I was raised with. So I started arguing with a lot of my Christian peers and doing more research into arguments against Christianity. And it kind of developed to a point where I started mocking more than arguing because I kind of increasingly saw it as just this old delusion that was holding people back and people weren't even willing to consider it. So one of the main events in that time period was I was going to school and they had an, a period called Spirit Week, which was the, this like series of themed uh, days before the prom. And one of the days that we had was Fictional Character Day. Mm -hmm. So I went uh, to Fictional Character Day dressed like the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a paper mache halo and I drew the stigmata, the, you know, the holes in his hands with Sharpie marker and um, brought a little plastic hammer because he was a carpenter. And so that was kind of going to be like a shock value kind right. of mocking right. argument against all of this stuff that I kind of felt like I was being surrounded by basically the worldview that I had so vehemently decided to reject. And ultimately what happened was I made it to the school, but at my school, everybody would kind of congregate in the cafeteria waiting for the first period bell to ring. And before I could even make it to my first class, the principal and the assistant principal and the school resource police officer kind of pulled me aside and just informed me that I was not permitted to wear this costume for the remainder of the day. So I tried to argue with them about it because they told me, you know, it's fictional character day, but Jesus wasn't fictional. And I said, well, yeah, maybe there was a Jew named Yeshua 2,000 years ago, but that doesn't mean that the Jesus that you guys believe in and teach about is, is not fictional. You know, I don't think he was God or walked on water or changed water into wine or healed people. So that is what I'm dressing up as, like the fictional Jesus of your faith, not necessarily the character Jesus from history. And so, you know, but it wasn't really meant to be a discussion. <laughs> so <laughs> as much as I tried to say that it was really fictional character that I should be allowed to wear uh, the costume, they ended up making me take it off anyway. Mm -hmm. So I had, had to take, you know, my robes off and I had, you know, regular clothes on underneath. And it was kind of the talk of the school for the remainder of the day because everybody had already seen it mm -hmm. and we were all waiting for first period class together. But what really changed it was that I went home that night and I discovered that there was a group called the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which is essentially a group of atheist lawyers. And I wrote them a, an email explaining the situation to them that, you know, I had tried to be Jesus for fictional character day at my school, but they had prevented me from doing so. And they pretty quickly got back to me and uh, offered to let me write a, a letter about my an essay about my story for their newsletter and they also sent a pretty strongly worded letter to both the principal of my actual school and then the superintendent of the school district kind of threatening legal action if they could discover any more anti-atheist bias in their policies and in, in an investigation and so once that happened the local channel 4 news heard about this letter and they came to my house and asked to interview me so then a week later, I'm showing up to school and all of my peers are saying, I saw you saying that Jesus didn't exist and he was a fictional character on TV this morning. <laughs> so that was kind of my, my 15 minutes of, you know, atheist out, outspoken fame when I was in high school. And then along that line, as I was constantly arguing with people, I ended up changing my own way of living, not just my way of thinking, because as far as I was concerned, becoming an atheist had liberated me from this like narrow moral moral chain that didn't necessarily need to be adhered to anymore and the only other people that I was connecting with that had similar views not all of them were exactly the same some of them were more vaguely spiritual even if they weren't Christian was really into what you could have kind of concisely described as a sex drugs and rock and roll lifestyle mm -hmm. so I started living out what I saw as the logical conclusions of the idea that there's no God and no meaning and just kind of try to have as much fun as you can but 
ultimately that actually only leads you to despair and ended up being so concerned about having fun that I dropped out of school, didn't try to get a job, didn't have any money, just spent every day trying to get with my friends and make sure that we could, you know, do various things that would be entertaining. But then I also kind of slowly realized that they weren't really my friends mm. at all because, you know, we were doing a lot of things. Some of them were not necessarily legal and I ended up getting arrested at one point for um, possession basically. And when I was on probation and I couldn't, you know, partake in some of our activities anymore, nobody talked to me. I, they, there was no actual community. They, were, they didn't want to hang out with me if I couldn't do what they were doing. So I became extremely depressed and lonely and I wasn't going anywhere in my life because I had just given up on any idea of meaning or progress or a goal that I was living toward. So I ended up basically becoming suicidally depressed mm. and just thought there was no meaning and my life wasn't going anywhere because I hadn't been doing anything with it. And so I remember I told one of my brothers that if that I was probably going to kill myself. And right after I kind of made that decision, I started having this nagging feeling that maybe I had been wrong about Jesus or maybe I'd been wrong about Christianity. Mm. But I didn't really understand why I was having that feeling because if there was one thing I knew for sure was that I wasn't wrong about it. It kind of you know, had been the fundamental uh, shift in my entire path of life was realizing that that was a delusion, it was bogus. So they kind of had this nagging feeling that felt very external because I didn't, there was no internal doubt really for me. But I kind of just ignored it for a little while. And what I ended up trying to do is, um, I kind of realized maybe the the nagging feeling was was indicative of the fact that my whole worldview was just a rejection of something else. Hmm. Because I kind of realized I didn't actually believe anything for myself. I just knew what I didn't believe and what I had been raised to believe wasn't what I believed anymore. So I was living my entire life as a rejection of something else. And it occurred to me that probably isn't the way that someone should have a worldview. If there was a truth, which, which was something that had been instilled in me from, uh, from my childhood when I, was, when I was a Baptist, and the idea that there was a truth, there is truth in the world. So it, when I rejected Christianity, I still believed that there was a truth, but I realized I hadn't been searching for that yet. I had just been fighting what I thought was a delusion. So I kind of tried to start researching the various religions again to kind of cobble together my own faith and that was what kind of led to the transition where I would ultimately yeah. have to study this question again. Sure. You know, it, it is interesting that I think so many people in the world, whether they're in uh, organized religion or, or, or outside, they, they live for a lot, you know, they persist with cognitive dissonance, right? Mm -hmm. Where they're not, they don't really f concretely believe in one thing or another, and, and they don't really follow things to their conclusions. I mean, you really did. I mean, mm -hmm. you, for you, again, as you said, you took your atheism seriously. Like, this, if this is if true, if all this stuff is bogus, then, yeah. well, then morality, all this kind of stuff, you know, you really, <laughs> yeah. there's a consistency there. Uh, and it's a scary place that it leads yeah. to. But it also, I mean, in, in God's grace, that it actually opened you back up to the idea of, okay, wait, yeah, but what, what are things like? Mm -hmm. What is truth? What is the nature of, yeah. of reality? It was the being consistent and following the atheism to its log logical conclusion that actually ended up opening me up to the idea that maybe, you know, it, it wouldn't have occurred to me at this point, maybe atheism right. wasn't correct, but it just, it, it felt more and more like a rejection of something else. And so kind of what I ended up doing was I decided that I would challenge God mm -hmm. and say, you know, I'm having this nagging feeling that maybe I was wrong about you for what I consider to be absolutely no valid intellectual reason. But considering the fact that I don't think I'm going to be here for much longer anyway, I'm going to give you a chance to prove to me that you exist. So I went into my room one day and I, I prayed, you know, basically that, you know, God, I don't know why I'm even talking to you. Pretty sure you don't exist, but I'm not going to exist very much longer either if I just continue in this path. So if you do exist, you know, you, you, ha you have a last chance to demonstrate that to me. And um, I decided that I would 
start reading the New Testament starting through Matthew as kind of um, an opportunity to, to encourage this possibility that Christianity was true. And what ended up happening was something that I didn't expect, which was that, you know, for a period of months, I would read a little bit of the Bible and I would say like my challenge prayer, asking God to prove himself. And every day when I would put the Bible down on the desk, as soon as I was done reading, something would happen that was directly related to whatever the last passage I had read was. So one of the most memorable uh, occasions of this was it was the 4th of July and I was reading through Matthew and I got to the passage where Jesus says, you know, don't cast your pearls before swine, don't give what is holy to the dogs. And that was the last thing I read. And I put the Bible down and then exactly the moment that the Bible hits the desk, I get a knock on the door and it's my next door neighbor saying, hey, it's the 4th of July, but I noticed you guys aren't doing anything, but we're having a cookout. If you wanted to come over, you could have some of our food. We've got plenty. So I said, okay. And I started walking over there. And as soon as I walk into their yard, his father was kind of, you know, dishing out this roast or something. And as soon as I get close, he just kind of snaps his head over at me and he says, if you don't eat your food, I'm going to throw it to the dogs. And I was like, well, that's not a normal <laughs> greeting. And so he, he kind of just uh, quoted or paraphrased one of the last things that Jesus had said to me. Huh. And so this happened, you know, over and over again. And also what I kind of started to realize during this period was that if I was willing to believe something that wasn't nothing, that wasn't just a rejection of something else, then really I had to figure out what was my bias against Christianity specifically right. and w whether or not it was a valid bias. Because at this point I realized I need to believe something that's not just a rejection of Christianity, but if I'm going to open up the possibility of some sort of worldview, I have to figure out is is there a bias against a specific one? You know, what makes any kind of worldview acceptable? But it was at this time it wasn't super intellectual because I still was kind of convinced that religion in general didn't make sense. Right. But these occurrences kept happening where I couldn't really explain why even though nobody knew I was reading the Bible or challenging God, people would come up to me and quote the last verse I had read or something in my life would happen the same day as a, a reading of a particular passage. So that's when I thought maybe I would just give Christianity a chance, give it a go. And I kind of thought if I'm wrong, then it won't really matter because nobody will know. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's not going to change anything. But if I'm right, then maybe that will explain where this nagging feeling is coming from that I was wrong. Yeah. Again, that's, that's a really... Oh, significant moment, right? This sense that, you know, after you followed it all to conclusion, there's still this nagging feeling. And you and you mentioned, too, that not, not so much an internal, but an external. And I feel, I feel like that's a significant thing, too, because I think part of the, part of the issue is sometimes in our, in our ideologies that we hold tightly to emotionally, then we, we lose them. And that's a big calamity, but we recognize that like, one of the big differences with a true religion, right, is that this isn't man's search for God, but mm -hmm. it's, it's God wanting to invite you into relationship with him. And God's always there. But sometimes we're not really open to that kind of real active religion. We kind of want a nice tight ideology. And so even that sense that this is something, this this nagging feeling is something external, something yeah. that's beyond me, right? Yeah. And especially because at this time, there was kind of the pride of, I had figured out that everybody was wrong. Right. So I didn't want there to be any external influence in my belief system because I had no trust in the idea of other people influencing my beliefs, even though, ironically, the whole atheism thing came from specific people who right. had convinced me that a different worldview was wrong. But So what ended up happening was, after a series of these um, God incidences that I was having, I ended up going into my room and kind of just praying a concession to the challenge prayer, which was essentially... All right, <laughs> so I still don't really know how it's possible that you believe. Intellectually, I don't really understand it, but I can't keep denying these things that are happening to me, so I want to come back. I want you to accept me back. I want you to forgive my sins, you know, show me that, you know, validate that this is where I'm supposed to be going. And it was an interesting experience because when I started the prayer, it kind of felt silly because I had been so convinced that everything related to religion was a delusion for, for years. But as I was praying, I actually had a physical sensation of weight being lifted off my shoulder. It wasn't just a, a, like a turn of phrase. Like for, I actually felt either something being exiting my body or being lifted off of my body. I felt lighter, felt relieved. And that was strange. But I was, this was also kind of like at the end of a long day of trying to figure out what I should do. So after this, I, I just went to bed. Mm -hmm. Now, 
um, a little backstory has to be um, mentioned before the rest of the story makes sense. Um, one thing is that I hadn't been having dreams at all because of the different substances that I was getting involved in and such, uh, when you use them so frequently, it can mess up your brain chemistry. And most of my nights were just long, dark, black, you know, it, nothing. So it was kind of reflective of my, my beliefs at the time. But, and also the other thing is that when I was an atheist, I used to associate myself with this um, Egyptian crocodile god named Sobek. And he was just kind of known as like the god of hedonism. His like uh, title was he who eats while he mates. So, um, and, mm -hmm. and Sobek in some languages actually translates to ego. Mm -hmm. So I kind of took it as uh, like a character, like a patron anti-saint almost. Where even though I didn't really believe that he was real, he was kind of like my mascot. And I, you know, every, I would use his name as like my code name and stuff like that, or like online as a username. And so what ended up happening was I went to bed and for the first time in years and for the only time that in my, in my whole life when I've been able to remember a dream from the beginning to the end completely, I was walking along the Nile and as I'm walking, this huge 20 foot long crocodile comes out of the water and starts chasing me, chomping at the bit. And so I'm panicking and I start running in the opposite direction, fearing for my life. But in my panic, I ended up tripping in the sand and just landing face first. And as I land, I start trying to, you know, scurry back to my feet, expecting the crocodile already to be there. And instead, as I slowly kind of rise, I notice that he's cowering into the Nile with, with his tail tucked between his legs, kind of quivering. And then as I continue to turn, I notice that there's this like shining angelic figure between us protecting me. And that was the moment that I woke up. And for me, it was shocking for a number of reasons. First of all, I didn't have any <laughs> dreams at all and let alone such a clearly symbolic, right. almost you know, divinely inspired one. And that was really the moment where my life changed because I viewed it as a confirmation of coming back to Christ. That, yeah. that was God's way of letting me know, I'm gonna protect you from your old, your old life and kind of validate that this is where you're supposed to be going. So from that point, I knew that I was a Christian. I just didn't understand why yet. Yeah. Well, let's take a break there. That's really fascinating, <laughs> fascinating point to end on, you know, the, the symbolism there and, and even the sense that it, it's funny, like whether or not we believe in the, in the spiritual world, if it's real, it, it believes in us, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, the, the good and the bad, right? And so there's, there's stuff going on there, you know, we would say. So we'll, we'll come back to the rest of your story yeah, here in just a good. minute. I wanted to remind you, again, if you're watching tonight, we're going to be back in just a couple minutes to hear the rest of Jeffrey's story. Um, a written version of his story can be found at chnetwork.org slash story. The title is From Mocking Jesus to Worshiping Him. Uh, so you might want to check that out there. It's a good way to share this uh, maybe with some of your friends who might find it interesting. Uh, really good stuff, Jeffrey. We'll be back in just a minute to hear the rest. See you then. Well, welcome back to the Journey Home program. Uh, we're entering the second half of our hour tonight talking to Jeffrey Schott. He's a former Baptist, Baptist but um, atheism, his atheism was really the, the more the crux of his story. And when we left off, um, you just shared with us this, this moment of uh, you begun to pray this prayer of, of inviting God to, if, if you're there, God, mm -hmm. right, show yourself to me. You've been having these experiences that really made you question the sense of kind of an external nagging thing. And then you have this crazy dream, yeah. right? <laughs> after years of not dreaming, you know, that impacted you. So yeah, pick us up from there. Yeah. So after I woke up from that dream, it it was it was obvious to me that it was a Christian now, and uh, I didn't really know what that meant, but I knew that you had to tell people about it. <laughs> that that was what I was raised. You know, you're supposed to talk to people about Jesus, and yeah. so I, I immediately started telling people, you know, that I was a Christian now. And a lot of them thought I was joking, you know, because uh, at this point we had moved to Florida from Tennessee, and so I wasn't actually near most of my the friends I had been had grown up around. But I started, you know, talking to them online. You know, hey, I just want to let you know that I converted to Christianity, and they would be like, "Oh, that's a really good one, Jeff. <laughs> you know, that's, that's hilarious." Um, so it, there was kind of a, a period of time where I had to convince people that it wasn't playing a practical joke on them, but there was also people who were kind of mad. There was, there, was, there was about three classes of people. There was the people who thought I was joking at first. Then there was the people 
who had become atheists because of me or who had been weakened in their faith because of me when we were in high school together and they were kind of irritated or almost like uh, defensive you know so you're saying that all the stuff that you told me that made me leave my my faith and experience all these you know family troubles and, and those sorts of things like that now you don't think that's true anymore and then there was the third group of people which was the people who had been Christians that would argue with me when I was an atheist and now they wanted to know well what do we say to people that are that are atheists you know what what, what brought you back and my big problem was I had no idea. Mm. Um, I didn't really know. It wasn't an intellectual conversion at first. And in retrospect, I think that was uh, really providential mm. because I had become an atheist because I thought I had figured it out or at least figured out that something was wrong or that what I believed was a delusion. So my, it was really a, kind of a prideful intellectual deconversion to atheism. So then I think when you know God orchestrated bringing me back, he wanted to make sure that I knew I hadn't figured anything out. <laughs> it, it was all him bringing me back. But it still was important after that yeah. to understand why it had happened and to be able to answer the questions I was getting because, you know, once I started telling people, there was a period of months where almost every day someone was reaching out to me and saying, you know, hey, I used to argue with you or you convinced me this or that, so what do you have to say now? And so that meant I had to figure out what I had to say now. I started going online and kind of asking, you know, what kind of books should someone read if they want to understand why Christianity makes sense? Or what, what kind of book would someone read if they were an atheist before? And so I got a bunch of recommendations. The uh, first two I ended up reading were kind of, it might not have been expected, but one of them was uh, Training in Christianity by Soren Kierkegaard, hmm. and the other one was The Confessions of St. Augustine. Well, you, you didn't start in the shallow end. No, I didn't. Look at that. <laughs> These are I'm just reading what people told me to read, and, and those two books just completely changed my perspective of Christianity, yeah. uh, actually especially the one by Kierkegaard. And then I started reading things like C.S. Lewis, um, trying to figure out, you know, what are the basic arguments that people have for Christianity? And I was interacting with these different groups online, telling them that I used to be an atheist and now I was a Christian and trying to understand Christianity. But then what I kind of quickly encountered was that these people didn't even agree about Christianity themselves because I was just going to general Christian places on the internet where there's all sorts of denominations and they would all be excited when somebody becomes a Christian from being an atheist, but then they all telling you different things <laughs> about what you should believe. So right. the initial period after I came back to Christ was mostly just, why is Christianity true at all? But then it quickly became a question of, now what do I do? Because I had started to wonder if I should even go back to church at all. Because I kind of, as an atheist, I wasn't just against beliefs, it was also like organized religion specifically. The idea of an institutional church or going to churches on Sunday, that kind of stuff. So for, there was a small period of time where I thought I was just a really special Christian who, you know, saw through the lies of the majority of this delusion, but then had this encounter that gave me a special insight into the truths of Christianity. And I kind of was trying to play that out, but it's not really sustainable. So I realized I needed to go somewhere. And I started going back to just kind of the non-denominational Baptist type churches that I was raised in, even though I'd, I wasn't sure why I was doing that because I knew that's where I came from. That that's what led that that experience was why I was an atheist right. in the first place. So I and and I would t go to these uh, churches and for example I would go to like a small group and we would have like you know, this awesome Bible study and then for me I'm not looking at it as I used to be a Protestant. I'm looking at it as I used to be an atheist and now I'm trying to figure out why Christianity is true. So I would ask them questions like, okay, well where did you get that idea? Like, wh why, why are we reading these books? Mm -hmm. Or why are we interpreting these books in this way? Is there, do you have a resource I can look into that explains why your church interprets the Bible this way or why we, why we do things this way? Because I knew there were differences and I wanted to know why people did different things. And a lot of them just didn't have an answer. Like, right, right. We, we just read the Bible and we do what it says. And so I kind of was looking in for more substantial answers to my questions. And, but at the same time, um, being a, a opposed to organized religion. So I expressed this concern online and said, you know, hey, the idea of a Christianity that has some more substance to it, more history, more thought and development sounds really appealing, but I also really don't like the idea of a church that tells me what I have to do and think necessarily or, you know, is, is closed off to more modern ideas, you know, about, you know, maybe like uh, gay marriage or 
uh, one of the things I was interested in was universalism. So I was like, where can I go where I can get more substance but not necessarily have to believe exactly what somebody else decides that I have to believe? And the answer I got was that I should go to an Episcopal church. Hmm. So that was a very interesting experience for me because I'd never been to a liturgy before. So I went to this Episcopal church and it ended up actually being what they would, they called themselves Anglo Catholic. Right. So it was smells, bells, altar rail, mm -hmm. incense, um, you know, everybody kind of lined up and knelt for communion. And I had never experienced anything like this. Right. So for me, it was, there was an immediate attraction to what seemed to be a resolution to a problem I was having that I was reading all of these things that made a lot of sense and it was increasingly becoming attracted to Christianity as it had existed uh, throughout the ages, but I'd never actually experienced people living it out. And so the, for the first time I went to a liturgy, I was like, oh, this, this rings more true with the way that people have been explaining Christianity to me in the books that I was reading. And I ended up, you know, getting taken out to lunch by the rector and walked around the parish by different people and they explained to me that, you know, this is the... Uh, perfect middle way between, you know, Protestantism that doesn't seem substantial enough to you and then Catholicism, which seems overly oppressive or a different organized religion. And, you know, I was like, cool, this is great. <laughs> and, uh, but what ended up happening was, it seemed like every other conversation we would have at the, at this parish was about how we weren't like the other Episcopalians because they were a very traditional conservative parish. So, things that were kind of dividing that their communion at the time, whether it was, you know, debates about gay marriage or about women's ordination and stuff like that. It was every conversation kind of ended up coming back around to, you know, we're not like the other Episcopalians. Right, right. And so I was kind of getting this vibe where it was, you know, so we're not Protestants and we're not Catholics and we're not like the other Episcopalians. So it was a lot of knots. Yeah. And it reminded me of when I was an atheist, I just wasn't, a Christian. And so that didn't really, I, I started to feel like, again, this is just a rejection of something else. I don't want to be involved in a rejection. Yeah. I don't and, want, and if you're rejecting, why are you rejecting? Like it yeah. begs the question, right? Yeah. Why are you rejecting it? And the more I was started digging out into things online, the more I noticed this trend where, you know, people would be presenting their case for their different traditions. And the only people who weren't describing their fundamental beliefs as a rejection of something else seem to be the Catholics because, you know, different people would say, oh, we don't like, you know, we're, we're in this tradition because we reject the Pope or we're in this tradition because we reject icons or we're in this tradition because of this or that. And the Catholics, their position seemed to be basically Jesus started our church. And I was like, oh, well, <laughs> okay. well, that seems like what the church that Jesus started would say. Not necessarily, you know, we're the church you should come to because we're not like that church or not like this church, just this is the church that Jesus started, and our beliefs are these beliefs, and it's not based on rejecting something else. So Catholicism became more interesting to me at that point, but I was still really hesitant to accept it because of the organized religion aspect. It wasn't necessarily that there were beliefs that Catholics had that I particularly disagreed with. I just knew that if I signed up for it, I had to accept everything. Mm -hmm. And it was that was exactly the opposite of what I had been kind of inculcated in as an atheist, where you don't, you don't just accept everything somebody says. You're questioning, you're questioning. So what ended up happening was I expressed to some of my friends, my Christian friends who still lived in Tennessee, that I was considering Catholicism and that it was increasingly interesting to me. And one of them uh, wasn't super excited about that, <laughs> and he asked his youth pastor to kind of rein me in. So he... he connected us and said, you know, here, this is my youth pastor, and uh, you guys need to hash this out. So this youth pastor and I ended up be quickly becoming uh, pretty good friends and talking, you know, sometimes hours a day for months. And what was interesting was he knew that he didn't want me to become Catholic, but he didn't necessarily know why yet. And so he was researching objections that he didn't already have. Mm -hmm. So he was going, he was going and digging for objections, <laughs> and then he was bringing these objections to me, who wasn't a Catholic. So it was, you know, one guy's trying to figure out why someone shouldn't become a Catholic, and the other guy's trying to figure out how to respond to that. So I ended up kind of, I got put in the position where I was, you know, becoming a Catholic apologist before I was even Catholic. And what ended up happening during that period of time was, every time he would bring an objection to me, I would have to say. I have no idea what this is, but I'll go look into it. And then when I would look into it, 
it seemed like it made a lot more sense than what he was presenting me with. So effectively having to defend my interest in Catholicism ended up convincing me of Catholicism because all the objections that were brought to me seemed like they failed when I actually investigated it. Right, right. And so then I realized that I should actually do something about it, especially because the more we were arguing, the more I realized you could argue forever. And I realized there's always going to be someone a lot smarter than me who's coming from a different tradition who could convince me out of whatever I believe if I'm basing it purely off of this idea that we need to debate our theology endlessly, essentially. So I'd, right. I kind of just thought I need to pick somewhere where I can go and be formed and just that the best possible place I could go seemed to be the place that was willing to actually form me in their own beliefs and not in a rejection of somebody else's beliefs. And so I started going to RCIA. And when I went to RCIA, I, at the same time, I started a new job that I worked like an overnight shift, which meant that nobody was actually at my workplace for most of my shift. And I could listen to whatever I wanted to with my headphones on. And I started listening to just like four or five or six hours every day of different Catholic podcasts where they were, you know, explaining more and more about the different perspectives that they had and, you know, the biblical arguments for it and the historical arguments for it. And for me, one of the main things was I had to finally be, be convinced about the authority of the church uh -huh. because that was what I had a problem with. Because a lot of times when Protestants or people who are raised Protestant become Catholic, it's an objection to Mary or the saints or right. the Pope or, you know, maybe the Eucharist if, if it's, uh, you know, they view it as a, a symbol. But all that stuff for me was just really interesting and kind of just exciting because I didn't have a predisposition against Catholic doctrines specifically. I just had an objection to the idea that somebody could tell me what I had to believe. Mm -hmm. But the more that the idea of apostolic succession was explained to me and the connection between the hierarchy of the church and the hierarchy of the people of God in the Old Testament and the idea that, you know, God had established it's so that somebody who was in my position of constantly questioning and coming across all these different arguments that there was there should be somewhere where you can go where there could be a definitive answer right and i realized that that was only really possible in catholicism so the fact that it was a necessary thing that was only possible in one place i kind of just decided if the church is right then i'm wrong and it's it probably has been thinking about this for a lot longer than i have two thousand years of people writing and questioning so i just needed to submit to whatever objections that remained because it was my job now to receive instruction and kind of admit that my old prideful way of thinking that i knew everything had clearly not led me into the best place and so that's where we went from there wow so you, it, that, did you follow RCIA all the way through? And yes, I went all the way through RCIA. And it was kind of an interesting experience for me because I had already spent the past, you know, two and a half years, uh, like year and a half, two years, researching and defending Catholicism to this youth pastor. So then when I went to RCIA, it was, I, I felt like um, I had already kind of learned a lot of this stuff. But what I needed to also realize was that it's not just about what you know. Mm -hmm. uh, because you have to live and learn the mm -hmm. liturgy and learn to change your lifestyle because that was one of the other things was when I was coming back to Christianity after atheism, I had lived this completely different lifestyle from what's ex you know expected of a Christian or you know conducive to a Christian life. And so I was it was very the intellectual aspect of the conversion was really appealing and it kind of happened pretty quickly, but actually learning to live a different way was one of the things that I had to experience in RCIA. Even though I thought I knew as much as I needed to know, I realized that I wasn't living the way that I needed to live. Right. Yeah, those two streams, I think, are really important in, in these kind of stories, right? There's the kind of the intellectual stream of, of what I believe, you know, the content. But then there's, there's how we're living, and then how, the way that how we're living affects who we are. Mm -hmm. And the, the reality is that the, who we are conditions our ability to receive what's true, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you, the kind of person, I mean, you you talked a bit about the pride and humility kind of axis there that, you know, as we as we grow in our pride, we're actually closed off more from truth. And you had to kind mm -hmm. of grow into some humility that made you open to truths that you were kind of closed off to before. 
Yeah. So there's those two streams, you know. It, the way, yeah. if you're living a sinful life, it can predispose you to beliefs that will justify remaining in a sinful life. Yeah. And one of the main things for me about the, the whole conversion process was um, my first confession. It was my first experience of a, of a sacrament after my baptism, you know, which was at that point decades ago. Right. And I remember having to come up with this long <laughs> list, you know. <laughs> I was openly mocking Jesus, convincing people that Christianity wasn't true, not to mention all the other, you know, various sins that I was um, it, it being exposed to and participating in. And one of the main things that I had struggled with throughout my life was, like, sadly, like many me young men, I was introduced to pornography at a, at a very young, young age and it had become an addiction that kind of uh, stretched my whole life. And I remembered that when I was, because it was so long ago that I was still a Baptist, a little Baptist kid, and I remember having this problem where I wanted to feel forgiven, but I didn't know how. And every time I would try to pray for forgiveness, I, I just knew that I was going to keep doing it, even if I felt like at the time that I didn't want to keep doing it because I felt guilty. But I never felt forgiven because there was no, I just kind of like had to do these like mental gymnastics, like was I free? Right repenting in the right way or how did I know that God received my repentance or how did his forgiveness get applied to me yeah. and so I there was kind of this like dread of the idea of sin and how it could possibly be removed even though I knew I was taught that you know we we're washing the blood of Jesus and stuff like this so when I went to my first confession one of the things I ended up mentioning was this you know long-standing uh, struggle with pornography and it was a miraculous experience for me that after my first confession I just never had a desire to view pornography That's again yeah. and so there was it was for me it was for the first time in my life I felt forgiven and then I also was strengthened to actually continue a life that was holy or not mm -hmm. not necessarily mm -hmm. perfect but there was it seemed like there was actual progress that was being right. made and that the grace of the sacrament actually changed my life for me that was a a, a very concrete expression of the truth of Catholicism being played out in my life by experiencing that first confession I was able I'd received a, a great grace of just that addiction being broken that's beautiful yeah the sacraments again that that question of well you know I, I approach God in prayer and am I forgiven does he hear me mm -hmm. and all that you know we we know as Catholics that God gives us the normal means but he can work in various mm -hmm. ways and so we but the amazing thing about the sacraments, right, is that God shows up. Like we're able to have this this certainty that God shows up there. And so then this question of, well, how do I know that I'm really sorry? I go to Jesus. Yeah. Just like I would, you know, in the, if I was there in gospel times, how do I know that I really want to repent? Well, I go to Jesus yeah. and say I repent and I, and I ask for forgiveness. Well, we have the, in the sacraments, we know this place where God has shown up. And so when I go there, I can have this certainty. And then I can even hear, again, through the, through the priest, the, the words, you are forgiven. Mm -hmm. So it's and a beautiful more, gift. Yeah. More of a certainty, like you said. And also, there's the fact that all the sacraments are really ordered to the Eucharist. Yeah. And that was kind of one of my experiences of RCIA was just when I was studying the different kinds of Christianity and I realized that some of them taught that the real presence of, of the Eucharist. And I thought, well, obviously, you've got to be there. <laughs> you know, if, if they have actually Jesus, you know. And, and so for me, RCIA was kind of this process where I was just increasingly pining for the Eucharist and uh, because I knew that if it was true that that was the only place you could possibly be if you believed in the Lord. You yeah. know. We've got about six minutes left and I have about a thousand questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm only going to get a couple of them. Uh, I'll try to tackle two at once and, and one is, first of all, you haven't talked about G.K. Chesterton. You mm -hmm. must do that. But we'll get into it this way. I mean, you noted a couple times in your story the suspicion about the Catholic Church was this worry because this is this is uh, too authoritative of an of mm -hmm. an institution. They're going to tell me exactly what to believe. Talk a little bit about the fact that, while on the one sense the Church will tell you some of the specific things, mm -hmm. the revealed truths, in another sense it's the least authoritative authoritarian institution in the world in terms of it, what it tells you you must believe because right, it's teaching you how to believe. It guards the the deposit yeah. of faith. But then there's there's a whole lot of then freedom of them. Now you have to go live this out, and it's not going to tell you what to what to what pair of pants to get up <laughs> to put yeah. on when you get up in the morning. It actually gives you the tools and the principles and sends you out. Talk a little bit about that the, yeah. the change in your understanding of what it means to have an authoritative church. Yeah, I'm one of the 
Chesterton, the expressions that he uses about the fence. Yeah. And if, if you come across a fence, you know, there might be an instinctual desire to remove the fence because it's a barrier. But really, you have, first have to ask the question, why is it here? Why here specifically? And who put it here? How long did it take them to put it here? Why did they go through all the effort of putting it here and then maintaining it? And what would be the consequences if we removed it? And I think once I read that, I realized that I had lived the consequences of that. And that, like you said, the church doesn't necessarily say, you have to believe this, this, and this, and this. But it does say, you shouldn't go further than this on this topic, and you right. shouldn't go further in the opposite direction than this. Yeah. And so it kind of gives you these guidelines to be truly free. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, there's the expression that freedom isn't necessarily you know, being free from restrictions, it's being free to excellence. Yeah. And if you don't have limitations, you know, it's like if you're playing, you know, music, if you don't have the instruction that says, you know, don't play louder than this here, or don't play faster than this here, if you don't have any guidance, then you, how free are you really to be excelling in your, in your right. life in your, or in your specific field? And so seeing the church more as a, a guiding force mm -hmm. that had all this, um, long-standing wisdom because that was one of the things that was really attractive to me was just you know as someone who has like a really inquisitive perspective mm -hmm. realizing there's people way smarter than you who have been thinking about this for way longer than you're going to be alive and the fact that they could come up with guidelines for people to kind of help them advance further because you have to benefit from what everybody else has done in the past yeah to be able to make any actual progress I think one of the other things that Chesterton wrote is right at the beginning of his book, Orthodoxy, yeah. that for me was really impactful was he tells a story about how he decided one day that he was going to invent his own rule of religion. Mm -hmm. And he, he compares it to a guy who gets on a boat in England and then starts sailing for the new world. And he thinks he's going to you know, come up with his own place and establish his own kingdom and have all these riches and then along the way there's this huge storm and he gets tossed about and he doesn't know which direction he's going in anymore. And then it turns out that after a long time of kind of floating around in the sea, he sees land again. And he's like, yes, the new world, I finally discovered it. I did it, I'm gonna be so successful. And then, so he has that thrill, but then when he finally gets closer, it's England. <laughs> and then he has the, so all the thrill of discovery, but all the comfort of um, being home. Yeah. And so that was kind of what, becoming Catholic was like for me uh, at one point when I you know saw that atheism was just a rejection I wanted to con create my own ideas and then I had all the excitement of trying to figure out where I should be and how I was so smart and then when I finally thought I had you know built up this great thing I was hu had the humbling comfort of realizing that I was actually just arriving back on the shores of where I had departed from but being able to see it in a new way with like a broader perspective and especially after the fear of being tossed about by the storm. Right, right. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit, you mentioned way back in the beginning about, um, in some sense, um, new atheism and a fundamentalist Christianity, oftentimes they, they read the Bible in the same way, mm -hmm. and they actually, in the end, end up being far more dogmatic than Catholicism. Mm -hmm. In other words, atheism will tell you there's a whole lot that you must not believe in. Yeah. You just can't accept. And so too with fundamentalist Christianity, like again, you give the example of the the 6,000 year uh, creationism, mm -hmm. right? That that there's a whole lot that you you cannot be open to. The Catholic Church will say, no, here's the, the few tenets of faith you absolutely must believe. They're revealed by God. But then as to the rest of, of the science, we're open to that. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a dialogue with, with faith and then what, what we discover in, in the world. And so the church is very conservative and cautious about, you must believe these, but it's not going to go beyond that. It's going to be very cautious because it's there to, not to to make up truth, but to simply guard the mm -hmm. deposit of faith that's been given. And so it ends up being the least <laughs> authoritarian yeah. uh, religion in the and world. And also the and the more authoritarian ones have the least availability for progress. Yeah. And it, and I forget who it was, but someone, you know, you could attribute anything to Lewis. So maybe it was C.S. Lewis. <laughs> but he said something along the lines of, you know, the atheists, they claim to be the free thinkers. But really, they're thinking inside of a box. They can't think there's a supernatural. Right. Like they, they have to think it's materialism. They have to go by science. Like They have this one limited way of, of determining the truth. And so for me, when I was an atheist, I always thought of myself as a free thinker. I was the one who was allowed to question anything. I didn't have to be bound to these certain ideas. But then as I became Catholic, I realized that now I had more things I could think about. I, yeah. I could actually think about the metaphysics behind explanations and and now that I had more possibilities, I also had these guide rails, like you said. So 
it's kind of, you know, in a sense that it's either you could have no guide rails, but you also have this kind of like box that you're in where you, you can't think anything outside of a specific box, even if you think you could go anywhere with it. Right. But how are you really going to go anywhere with it unless you have the guide rails that you're building off of and the ability to, to think of different ways of understanding the universe? Right. Oh, it's so good. Thank you so much, Jeff. Oh, thank you for having me. For your testimony and, and your witness, really appreciate it. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home Program. I pray that Jeffrey's story was an inspiration to you. Please share it with your friends. Uh, I, I know we have lots of people in our lives who are wrestling with these kinds of questions. Uh, and a good story is sometimes precisely what is needed to start off that questioning process. Keep us in your prayers. We're praying for you. God bless you. We'll see you again next week.